Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Asha, and I'm part of the IHS World Lab and Library team. And together, we host public text every month. Before we begin this evening's session, just a few things to keep in mind. Uh, please post all your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. We'll also be recording the session, and we'll be making it available on the IHS YouTube channel. The link will be in the chat box also. Uh, if you want to stay updated with all our events, you can actually leave your email ID also in the chat box and we'll add you to our mailing list. It's my pleasure to introduce our guests for today. We have Paro Anand and Paromita Chakravarti with us and they'll be talking about Paro's book, Nomad's Land. Paro Anand writes for children, young adults and adults. She won the Sahitya Akademi Bal Sahitya Puraskar in 2017 for her anthology, Wild Child, now published as Like Smoke. She has spoken about and written extensively on children's literature in India. She headed the National Center for Children's Literature, the National Book Trust India, the apex body for children's literature in India. She also runs a podcast on Hub Hopper called Literature in Action and was an invitee to the India Conference at the Harvard Business School in 2018. She was awarded the Kalinga Karubaki Award for Fearless Writing in 2019. She is well known for her work with children in difficult circumstances, including those impacted by violence in Kashmir, and has written extensively on the subject. Aromita, who will be moderating the session, is a writer and editor with the Indian Express. She writes on books and culture. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, again, and over to you, Paromita. Thank you, Asha. Um, it's lovely to be here to speak to Paro, as always, about her new book this time. I came to Nomad's Land at a time when questions about identity and belonging have been at the forefront of our public conversations. And uh, what I especially liked about this book is the fact that you go beyond the politics to look at how it impacts individual lives. Um, this is a story of two young girls from two displaced communities, Shana and Pima. And before we take this conversation further, I was wondering, Paro, if you could read a bit from the book. <laughs> I would love to. Uh, yeah. So, Nomad's Land, and I'm going to start at the very beginning. We know that that's a very good place to start. <laughs> um, mountain Girls. Mountain Girls, Children of Forever Skies and Endless Horizons. They are fed on yesterday's dreams and stories, told and retold endlessly. These dreams color their thoughts, guide their paths, even though the dreams are not their own. For their own dreams have not been fed by memories of homelands and yesterdays that they have never seen. The futures of what could have, should have, maybe have been. They dream, both of them, of living here today, now, in the now. Their dreams are made up of a fight with a friend, a movie they felt that they should have acted in, a boy they really wanted to talk to, the food they really wanted to eat. But their dreams are not of the world that their families have left behind. These are girls of forever skies and endless horizons, yes. But that was a long, long time ago. One of them, Shana, remembered it. She had seen it. She'd been a part of it. Her yesterday. But Pema, Pema had never seen it. For she was born after her family had fled the high plateaus of the Himalayan range. These are girls of forever skies that they have never seen. Shana protested sometimes, we can't live in mourning forever. But her words were met with silent disapproval or her mother's favorite line with a downturned mouth, you'll never understand. And Shana felt like raging back. Yes, you're right. I will never understand. Why should I? I've never seen it. But she didn't. It wasn't allowed. Not out loud. So she raged within her heart. 
back home, before they left, the school that Shana went to, more and more desks began to empty out as more and more of her people were leaving. And Shana, for the first time, began to feel that she was different. The lines, once invisible, began to show up and harden. And although her father always said, nothing will happen to us, we're one of them. The same words echoed by Huma, Shana's very best friend. Don't worry, nothing will happen. You're one of us. But as more and more of Shana's people were leaving, the Kashmiri pundits were fleeing the valley, Shana began to feel less like us and more like one of them who had gone. But then something did happen. So suddenly, like, like smoke, a wisp that rose straight up into the skies, she hoped that her father had not suffered too much as he blew up with his shop, his beloved shop that he refused to leave. Her father, her father had died. And Shana raged and raged at the injustice that one side could stay and the other side must leave. Who were they to decide? But she, she landed up on the side of leaving. And as they loaded onto the bus, the crush of the bus, the sweat of the bus, she saw Huma running down, racing down the, the hillside, running to say one last goodbye, one last hug. Shana turned away. These, these people were not her friends anymore. As the bus turned, the last Banihal bus, the last curve that would sever them from what had been homeland. A wail went up, but Shana shut her eyes. This wretched place deserved no more of her tears. They were homeless refugees now, refugees in their own country. So beautiful. It's really beautiful. <laughs> Oh, you know, displacement at the best of times is a difficult issue to speak about, especially to those who haven't had an experience of it. And you capture in this book the flavor of it so beautifully between Shana and Pema's lives. Pema, who has had no experience of it, but has only heard of it, and Shana, who's felt it firsthand. What, what made you choose displacement as a theme? Um, it actually, the story started cooking in my head a very long time ago. I was working, doing a project with the World Wildlife Fund for Nature. And we were working with a group of Pardi children. Now, Pardis are nomadic people. They don't belong anywhere. And they are one of the recently decriminalized tribes. And they may have been denotified, as it is called, that they are not criminals anymore officially. But People in the cities, in town, still treat them as such. One of the mothers of these children said, uh, said to me, we want to buy land. We have money to buy land. No one sells their land to us. And when we tried to get the children who we were working with into schools, because the parents obviously wanted their children to be educated, who doesn't? And they had the money to pay the fees. Schools didn't want them. And the principal, even under the Right to Education Act, principals were saying, these children don't belong to us. We're already overburdened under RTE. These children don't belong. 
So where do nomads belong was a question that started sort of churning within me. And I, I was going to write a very just direct story. But then that image of that Syrian child washed up on the beach of those fleeing Syrian. Mm. Yeah. Where did they belong? They didn't belong to the sea even. And they could, I mean, to die, this child could only find shifting sands. Um, and then the migration, I mean, the Rohingyas, um, people all over the world who are being displaced are being driven out saying, you don't belong to us. The Tibetans fleeing. And I thought I would write maybe the Tibetan story. But that was one story. I wanted, and yesterday someone gave me the word, the right word that I'd be looking for, the every man of nomads. So I made up a tribe, Kushavan tribe. And it was, that was a new adventure for me of making up a people, uh, making up their land, their, um, their language, their clothes, their culture, their beliefs. And it was really exciting. And I sort of pulled threads from all the stories that I'd been reading, but the writing became more and more urgent when children started fleeing cities during lockdown. When we turned our backs, turned my back, the story became very urgent. In fact, uh, this this you talked about creating a tribe and creating an in, entire ecosystem around them, but when I was reading the book, I could see, like you mentioned, so many, like you had the right word for it, every man of nomads. So many people came together in that story. So many isolated instances we've only read in newspapers or looked at as, uh, you know, what happens as a fallout of political events. Um, what, when you're trying to get it across to a young audience, what, you know, do you look to simplify that story? Do you how how do you want to talk like how do you want to tell them about displacement and what it does? You know, to stand in somebody else's shoes and feel it, like Pema eventually comes to do. How do you, how do you decide how to do that? Um, I have found over the years and my work with many children, over three lakh children, is what I you know who I interacted with. And perhaps now through lockdown, through COVID, um, you know, stay at home, maybe it's crossed three lakhs already. Um, they're incredibly wise. They're incredibly sensitive. And there's this part which, um, where Shana says to her, her mother and her grandparents, mm -hmm. children are born without hate. Yes. We teach them hate. We, we teach them division. Mm -hmm. And I, I have found children so much more open mm -hmm. uh, until we shut them up. And so it's very important. Do I simplify it, Parunita? No, I never simplify mm -hmm. uh, because I'm writing for a young audience. Even when I'm writing for very young children, I've just written a story called Sometimes a Baby, uh, uh, which I think will be out in a couple of months. Just okay. different kinds of families, um, whether it's same-sex families, single parent families, um, joint families, whatever, all kinds. Um, even there for very young children, they get it. So I never simplify. If you were to ask me, is there something that I don't do because I write for young people? Yes, there is one thing. I never leave the story without a note of hope, without an upswing. Yeah, because I don't want to leave them. The teenage years are a dark time, and that's the age group I largely write for. Um, so uh, I don't want to leave them in that very dark place there's a light at the end of the tunnel, no matter how dark that tunnel is. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, you've always talked about very difficult themes in your books and um, you know like smoke or no guns at my son's funeral um now in the last few years there's a scepter of age appropriateness that hangs over our things you've really you've had a share of it too um is it more does that come more from adults when you're writing do you face it more from adults than from your readers i'm really glad you asked that question and i don't call them adults <laughs> because of this subject i call them gatekeepers <laughs> really the darbans of uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why do I agree that yes parents gatekeepers do have the right to curate you know what their children read mm -hmm. at the same time I know that when I grew up we had an open shelf policy there was no such thing that certain shelves bookshelves and our house was full of books that you couldn't pull a book out of and I wasn't a great reader what turned me into a reader was pulling a particular book off uh, my parents bookshelf and reading it and i loved it and that converted me into a reader and therefore a writer so unfortunately what we've done is to sort of cut children up into little pieces mm -hmm. you know pre reader confident reader pre teen tween teen young and love being you know and i think are we saying this book is for 20 to 30s and 30 to 35 or anything like that no i mean is it that when you're 18 from now on what you can read whatever hmm. yes and no but i feel trust your kids uh let them get to a book that you know they can if they don't like it if they're not understanding it they ask what i have found is that parents teachers object sometimes to my books a couple of books have been banned out of schools children never object and i'll just share one little incident because at the end of my session i always say is there some subject that you'd like me to write on you don't you haven't found a book on that subject but you want there was a girl in a small school in haryana in a very small town in haryana she came to me afterwards you know after the teachers go and the crowd goes and everything the most couple of kids who hang on to have that private conversation mm -hmm. that the two gems and she said um mai aapse ek baat puchu hu i said ha puchu she said apne veere di wedding picture dekhi hai i said anji <laughs> she said ab jante ho main kiske bare mein puch rahi hu so i said ha main samajh gayi kiske bare mein puch rahi hu she uske bare mein kyun nahi likhte ho she was talking about the masturbation scene hmm she was i think 12 or 13 years old hmm that's what she wanted could i write it maybe would it get published unlikely would it get into a school never <laughs> but that's what the kid wanted mm -hmm. let's just start kids mm -hmm. there is fundamentally a disconnect somewhere right in the in how we perceive uh, children to be what they want from their reading and what we want to give them and in some sense i think it's emblematic of the larger problem of what we think is per permissible now and what we think is not permissible so um because reading is so um, tied up with our imaginative expansion and how we look at other other lives that we will never live uh do you see this whole focus on fixing what children will read as also a subtle uh, change in direction of how we want us to be in a few years you know how we want them to grow up as adults with fixed beliefs and fixed systems that you know kind of it's a prescribed path there is no room for surprises there yeah 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 well certainly there is quite a lot of on the one hand the concentric circles breaking up mm -hmm. and isolated circles instead you know that sort of 
connectivity has broken. Mm. But if you look at what's happened during the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, the, those circles have also meshed. Because we have so much access. Children have so much access to so much. Mm -hmm. We are perforce allowing them screen time. Perhaps more than most parents. Yeah. Other circumstance, but what's the choice? Mm -hmm. So they, are, they have access to a lot more information, to a lot um, uh, wider horizons and wider sets of people. I don't know what that is doing to the psyche and all. I'm not, I'm not a psychologist, I can't say I haven't studied it. But I think that, again, we don't need to fear the um, expansion. I think we don't need, I think we need to fear division more than multiplication. <laughs> 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 Which brings me to Kashmir. It's figured in so many ways in your books. What does the place mean to you? Um, when you go as a tourist, like I, I have family connect there very, very strongly. Um, but going there as going back to family, going there as going as a tourist is a very different experience from going there to do the kind of work that I've been doing there. Uh, the sort of beauty of it, the wonderful Vaza, Vazwan, and all of that disappears. disappears. And what's left is fear. What's left is isolation. What's, fear, what's left is indoctrination. And just again to share one example, I was in North Kashmir in a school, like very close to the border. And I told a story, kids really enjoyed the story. Um, these were class four children, class four or five. They really enjoyed the story. They laughed at the right places. They sort of were tense at the right places. They were relieved in the right places. I knew the story and story worked. But at the end of it, there was a kind of discomfort that the children were feeling. And I couldn't understand. I, it was new for that. And so I asked them, I said, kya hua? And they kind of, one boy was prodded to ask the question and he stood up and said, kya ye kahani sach hai? So it was about a bear who climbs on the moon. Obviously, it wasn't a real story. <laughs> So I said, as I always do, aapko kya lagta hai? And he said, nahi ho nahi sakti. I said, nahi, ye ka, ye nahi ho sakti. And they were like, oh. you know, almost like a physical drawing back. Mm -hmm. What happened? And again, this boy was persuaded reluctantly to get up and say, agar sach nahi hai, to jhoot hai. Okay. And I said, they didn't know what a story was. They had no concept of fiction. And I think that is a terrible kind of abuse towards childhood. They rob them of stories. I mean, it made me teary. It gives me goosebumps even now to think of children who didn't know what a story is. And I had to sort of chuck out my four days of workshop that I had prepared very hard and taken and talk to talk to them about what is a story and why is it important and what is imagination and pitch it at, you know, kids in class four and five. But they got it and they wrote some fabulous poems and stories and everything from it. Another incident where I had told, not in Kashmir, but with Kashmiri children here in Delhi, was uh, I had told a couple of stories. Again, the same question, is it true? And I said, aapko kya lagta hai? And I said, jo bhoot wali so nahi thi, wo nahi hai. In jis mein bhabi ki pitai hoti hai. There's a story called Bablu's Bhabi. In my book, uh, I'm Not But a Chicken. And um, she said, jis mein bhabi ki pitai hoti hai, 
I said, how do you say with so much confidence? She looked at me and she said, Kyuki, mere ghar mein bhi yehi hota. And a lot of children then participated in the conversation about domestic violence that they had been um, exposed to. Very young children. And when I was asking them, what do you feel when you see it? You feel it's right. None of them felt it was right. Do you feel that it's inevitable? Yes, they all felt it was inevitable. But the overriding thing that they felt was that uh, they felt helpless. And that left me feeling very shattered that children should never feel helpless in the face of that. So I wrote another story on domestic violence on what can you do yes. with situations which you know are wrong. What can you do? So an empowering story. Mm -hmm. Uh, this uh, this helplessness that you talk about that comes out beautifully in the book in in the nature of rage or the nature of helplessness that these two girls feel. Um, when you were determining the characters, when you were choosing the writing the characters, um, was there anybody you modeled them on? Was there any particular incident? You talk about so many children that you've met. Is there anyone? Uh, did you have anyone in mind for these girls? Um, several children, actually. <laughs> Several, uh, some boys as well. Um, there was a wonderful young um, Kashmiri Pandit girl coming back to the valley through a project I was doing with the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation. And we had them sit in a circle and talk about, um, so a, a lot of that comes into no man's land. Um, we had them sit in a circle and, you know, just play an ice-breaking game. They were Muslim children meeting the Hindu children for the first time, the Hindu children returning to the valley for the first time since they had been orphaned. And um, so it was that, you know, you say my name, so I'll say Paro, and then you have to say Paro, Paro Mita, and then you say Paro, Paro Mita, Akanksha, like that. So, it's just, you know, you get to say everybody's names. And this one... Uh, Kashmiri Pandit girl said, How many can Namni yaad kar? How many can Namni yaad kar sakte? I said, uh, Is a bade alag se naam hai. You know, very dismissive and fiery and angry and everything. And um, I thought, how complete that division. They had been classmates or would have been classmates. Mm -hmm. And now it was that I can't say the name. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of that, uh, uh, those incidents have fed into this. Yes, there are lots of children, not only Kashmiri children, but also I say some of the Parthi children. Um, Pema uh, herself is partly my daughter, actually, because she, <laughs> who, uh, because she is fiery, but she's a doer. Mm -hmm. She finds something needs to be done She's the first one to step up and do it. She has just adopted a little son. Yeah. <laughs> so I've become a nanny. Mm -hmm. I've also just become a daddy. Um, so, uh, you know, she, so Pema is this person who do the, wants to do the right thing. Who knows she has to keep her word. She wants to do it. Uh, but it's this quiet little mouse of Shana. Mm -hmm one who has to slip in and actually do. And I loved that. I loved that. that finally, this girl came into her own mm -hmm. uh, to help her friend at, at a time when she most needed it. There's a beautiful section in the book where she, uh, when Shana comes into her own, when she's having a conversation with some other classmates in mm -hmm. Pema's absence, and mm -hmm. she talks about hatred and how mm -hmm. it's not upon them to perpetuate it, to carry it forward. Yeah. Uh, could you read that bit a little yeah, bit? I, you know, I, I couldn't, uh, I didn't mark it out. <laughs> I marked out another one, I thought, actually. Okay. Please read uh, something else also. That's fine. Now. Should read something else. Uh, if I may, sorry, I didn't, you know, I actually misunderstood the part that you were <laughs> asking for. But yes, that actually is a section and I'll just share that. Mm -hmm. um, where Shana starts 
she, she's been so shy that she covers her mouth when she smiles. you know because no one should see this which is that shy she never meets anyone in the eye uh, as a lot of children in kashmir i found could have their you know have wear those caps over their heads so they don't you don't look into their faces and they don't look into yours um so she was uh, uh, shana is that person but yet suddenly she steps up and she says what they like, the northeastern girls in Tana and Pema school they dislike you know this state dislikes that state these people mm. like those people and she says why why do you and they say oh it's centuries old and she says yeah but why are you perpetuating it mm. again that same thing why do we why do we wear the cloak of hate just because centuries ago our people hated those people it's a cup panchayat kind of you know attitude that that hamare yahan aise hota hai so what do hate these people children don't know why they hate and that that came to me from directly from a school actually in delhi where i overheard a child say i hate muslims and i looked out of the window and i saw this 12 year old girl saying it loud and proud no embarrassment in this and she was surrounded by a group of her friends who were all nodding saying yes we hate muslims too mm-hmm. when i noticed one boy standing a lag say gray faced rooted to the spot he was obviously a muslim child who had been receiving this hate and i knew that you know this had to feature in mm-hmm. also so that is the fight that chana takes up mm-hmm. on um, you know, that she she takes up saying don't don't take on hate yeah. don't take the cloak of hate um so uh could we could i read i don't know how much i don't know how we doing for time but um I'm going to read a bit of Pema because we have oh, right yeah please So Pema lives a little bit like in the uh, Tibetan colony and that loosely in my mind And Pema sleeps in the same room as her grandmother who she adores her grandmother is her best friend Then late one night as Pema sat up rubbing her grandma's chest with balm inhaling the medicated steam that was now a permanent fixture in their home she saw her mola struggling to say something mola hugged her favorite grandchild and whispered hoarsely i am standing at the gate but who will help me cross pema thought that her grandmother may be slowly losing her grip on reality it frightened her to think that her dearest friend was unraveling before her eyes within her arms you're not standing at any gate silly she whispered into her grandma's ear you're right here within the safety of my arms in your own room in your own home this will never really be home a child my time has come i'm standing at the gate and you've taken me all the way here but i need help to cross help that you can't give me pema tried to dissuade her mola thinking that the words were escaping from a flailing mind but with an effort grandma pulled herself straight up Although her eyes were milky with age and medication she said in a voice that was clearer and firmer than it had been in a long time Emma she said pinning her with steel in her eye and grip Emma now listen very very carefully my time is very near but our people we have our ways when we are born we are born with a certain number of breaths and we must breathe our quota until we have one left 
just one left, and then we cross, and life leaves. I don't know why I was born with so many, many, many breaths, more than my own son even. Bema nodded. She knew about her uncle who had died when the family was fleeing, escaping to safety so many years ago. Mola had told her a lot about him, a laughing child, a rosy-cheeked apple of her eye. She had been told time and time again that she, Pema, reminded her grandma of him. She knew it was one of the reasons why she and her grandma shared this special bond. But tonight, despite her struggles with her breath, Mola's grip on Pema's shoulders were tight. Her eyes were clear. Pema, in our old ways, we have the custom of breathtakers. The word breathtakers sent a shudder down Pema's spine, although she had never heard the word before. She looked down, but her grandmother shook her again. Pema, Pema, you have to listen to me, please. I need your help. Pema remembered the promise that she had made to her grandma. If she ever needed help, she would be there. Pema didn't want to know about these breathtakers, but she knew that the Khushavans were people who kept their word, and she knew that she would have to keep hers. I'm No, carry on. No, no, no. I'll be, go ahead. I really wanted to ask you about the inspiration from for this, the race, the language, especially the language that you created. Breathtaking is such a such an original way of thinking of death. So, if you could talk about the language of this section, I thought of it at a painful place. I thought of it when my mother was sleeping away, and yet she wasn't. Most of her body had already shut down. But her breathing, she just breathed and breathed and breathed. And it was this in and out, in and out. And I'm thinking, how many more breaths must, must she suffer? Because she had always told my sister and me, when my time comes, let me go. Don't take me to hospital. Don't put me on machines. Just let me slip away. So we were honoring that. We were not, we had brought her home from hospital. But she wasn't slipping away. And I thought, I wish there was some way I could wrap up these breaths. And that's when I thought of breath takers. And I thought, I wish there was someone who could help this end of life process. So it came from a very painful place. And of course, when I was writing that part, I was weeping and I was winding. And at the same time, my heart was unwinding. And said, no, no, not yet, not yet, not. However she is, whatever it is, let her be, let her be, let her be here. You know, um, so yeah. Shall I read the that bit of it? Mm. If I, can. yeah. So eventually, just to share with the audience, eventually it's not Pema who can be a breath taker, and breath taking has been banned by government as government sometimes does, ban a particular ceremony, ban a particular way of being, but one size doesn't fit all. And it has to be an unrelated person, but breath takers are banned people. And so Shana takes up the challenge, despite herself, despite her fears, she overcomes her own hurdles uh, and learns how to be a breath taker. Shana kneels on the cushion on the ground. 
She gently taps the yak tail whisk just above Mola's chest and repeats the words that must be said for each breath. Sans ko mayu leaf. The leaf is long and drawn out as she places her left hand on Mola's chest to feel the heartbeat. Mola exhales a breath as long and as deep as she can manage. And the rooster feathers hung just above, flutter. Yeah, Shana gives the yak tail a flick and turn to wind the breath. It seems too simple. How could something so important be this easy and smooth? Again, the same doubts distract Shana and stay her hand. Mola opens her eyes, looking deep into Shana's. The girl shakes off thoughts and concentrates. She closes her eyes, keeping only Mola's face in her consciousness. Sans ko mayu, leaf da. Wind, sans ko mayu, leaf da. Wind, over and over and over, till the rest of the room and the world dissolve, and there are only the objects of relief and release and mola left. There are people in the room with her. More and more people are coming in. More and more people. Pema and her mother have already left. Mola had made them leave, saying that their presence was holding her back. Who are all these people filling the room? Sans ko mayu, leaf, exhale, wind. Sans ko mayu, leaf, exhale, wind. Sans ko mayu, Wind, exhale, wind, exhale, wind, exhale. The rhythm of the words hypnotizes and the room continues to fill up. Others are entering. Shana is gently rocking to the music that comes from the words, sans ko mayu, leaf, sans ko mayu, leaf, tap, wind, tap, wind. As she watches, the length and strength of Mola's breath decreases. The rooster feathers are barely fluttering anymore. Mola's face relaxes, the deep wrinkles absorbing back, and her face began, begins to look young. Sans ko mayu, leaf. Pema is repeating the words within herself, willing her grandmother to slip away. This is not frightening. It's soft. It's peaceful. A weight lifts from the grandmother. Her lips turn up in a slight, slight smile. Her eyes flicker open. There is a light. The milkiness is gone. Sans ko mayu, leaf. Sans ko mayu, leaf. The older woman looks around the room one last time. A look of such love, such peace. Her gaze comes back to rest on Shana. The love sweeping over the young girl, filling her. I'm ready, Mola whispers. I'm almost there, Druyosan. Shana nods, understanding, and resumes. Sans ko mayu, leaf. Sans ko mayu, leaf. Thank you are the last words from Mola. Shana looked up at last. She was surprised to see just Pema and her mother leaning on either side of the bed. There was no one else. Where's everyone gone? She asked. But there was no one. No one had come in. 
it had been just Shana and Mola at the end. Oh, Shana whispers, so many people came. They came to take her. Shana wept then, tears, tears for a woman she had never known but would never forget. She was now bound to her. The three wept silently for a while, Pema, her mother, and Shana. Pema's father came in and he helps Shana up to her feet. Her legs are numb from kneeling so long. But then Pema does a strange thing. He bends low, lays down, touching Shana's feet, and Shana recoils in surprise. No, 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 he says, looking up. You are a true Droyosan, a rare breathtaker. You are sacred to us now. Yeah. Great. Uh, so with that, let's uh, look at a few questions that have come in from the audience. Um, Annie from Twitter asks, as you pointed out, children internalize a lot of prejudice and quite often grow up to be adults who can see very little than what they believe to be true. What are your thoughts about that? As I, as I use the metaphor, although I'm lousy at maths, I finally found a use for maths. I think if we look at addition and multiplication for our children, as, as the life force for our children, rather than subtraction and division. We will strengthen the arms of our children and therefore the world that they inherit from us. Uh, there's one more. Uh, I have heard that your books have been taken out of curriculums in school. How do you address something like that with people who refuse to have a difficult conversation or don't want to uh, confront ideas that go against their beliefs? This is from Tara on Instagram. Um, yes, my, so a few of my books have been uh, and out of schools. Um, and what is very hurtful, I think, is that they've been banned more for the love than the hate. Um, so there is one girl in Like Smoke who has been brought up to hate Muslims because she's been told that her, her uh, father has been killed by Muslim bomb. And she falls in love with a boy who is Muslim. And he says to her that bombs don't have a religion and Muslims are not terrorists. Um, and they exchange a brief kiss. And that's what got the WhatsApp parents so agitated that they threatened the school and had the book thrown out of the school. They didn't object to the fact that there was hatred that there was a young girl being taught to hate. What they objected to was when she overcame hate. That's really painful. If you think of it in those terms, should parents be able to convey their beliefs to children? Of course, they're, it's their children. They must be able to. But I think it's the parents who have to cleanse themselves of the hate and of the division instead. And stories can do it. We may, we may believe that our children don't know, that they're not, you know, so I can't talk about it. My child doesn't know. Your kid is talking about it, only she's not talking to you about it. Yeah. And isn't it better that she comes to you with the doubts mm -hmm. than to X, Y, Z? Uh, there's one observation I have to make about the book, which I think spoke to me more because this is a year when we have all become little islands. 
you know the uh, the importance of touch in our relationships mm. and how shana craves for her mother's hug the friends hold hands i thought that was a beautiful thing that to read about about how love can be manifested through touch I, was that conscious in your mind when you were writing this what i think i'm a very tactile person and i'm finding it so difficult to not be you know i have to keep reminding myself not <laughs> don't, don't do it um, so mm, i think it's just from you know my own constantly i if if we were together i would have hugged you by now <laughs> <laughs> okay and your language how do you keep it so contemporary when shana is thrilling in school at some of the language that her classmates use uh, is it just being around young people a lot more uh one of the tools i think that most writers uh do use is eavesdropping <laughs> <laughs> I'm a shameless eavesdropper. Uh I was in fact uh, writing a novel for uh, about older women. Mm-hmm. So I would go to uh, IIC and Gymkhana club and order myself a coffee and sit next to a table which had older women and it's like what are they talking about what are the what's the language what's the tone. But yeah I think it is the fact that I uh read a lot of young adult fiction teen fiction and i work extensively i mean it's 50 50 my work with young people and i'm really missing that part mm-hmm. and my writing for them um and i think one of the best compliments i've ever got is i written uh, i one of my stories had been published in a magazine a newspaper and a letter to the editor came back saying thank goodness you finally got a team to write for teens and i thought okay that's a good compliment <laughs> Okay. Okay. On that note, I think uh, this is it. This was so good to speak to you, Parava. The book, which I really, Thank really you, like. Thank you. I, um, I think we are okay. I think we are done. Says Akash. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I just want to say that uh, although this the portion that I read out. Um, is of course about death this is very much a book about living and life yes. and when the big political pictures are happening we forget what's happening to children what's happening to young people and um i wanted to just end with these three lines which are the last lines of the book very stupid of an author to give away the right at the end but i'm doing it these nomads have found a family they found their land even nomads have land to call their own a home to call their own thank you thank you thank you so much thank you word lab and akaksha thank you so much for joining us today this has been really wonderful also very heartbreaking stories that come that you've kind of brought to us and uh, i mean like you said i just hope these kids discover the joy of stories and they actually have stories in their lives and it's not something that they need to be introduced to as an alien concept because you know that's all we've always know like we everything that we've learned about the world is really through stories so i hope that happens for everybody uh, i just like to thank both of you for joining us this has been wonderful and for everybody who's attended and everybody who sent us questions by the book by the book yes <laughs> <laughs> great uh you can uh, we'll be putting up the recording on the ihs youtube channel so that should be up uh, in a day or two so you can check out the recording there and we're on facebook twitter and instagram so you can keep up with all the work and all the events that ihs does thanks for everybody uh, i hope everybody has a lovely evening